Well, this video was certainly a long time in the making. Not only did it require me to do a lot of personal learning about recording and editing software, but this is also my first YouTube video. I'm excited to see if this goes anywhere, but if it doesn't, at least it was fun to do. While there has already been a million game reviews and discussion videos on Ocarina of Time, I haven't seen very many that really focus in and pick apart the dungeons themselves. So that's what I'm hoping to do. In this video series, I want to go over and give a critical analysis of all the core and side dungeon levels, really digging deep into their design, analyzing each important aspect within them and drawing conclusions on what does and doesn't work in each. Some of the major aspects I will be looking at are the quality of the puzzles, the aesthetic including music and visuals, enemies including the boss, pacing and difficulty, and how much fun these elements make playing each respective dungeon. As you already know, this video is going to focus on the first dungeon of the game. In future videos in this series, I will be lumping the side level with its corresponding dungeon when it occurs in the game. This is because the side levels don't have the same level of depth that the core ones do. Also, I would like to make it clear that I am by no means an expert, and what I say doesn't have to be final. Feel free to disagree with whatever I say here, I am open to discussion and critique. Now, onto the Great Deku Tree. For a lot of people, including me, this was the very first Zelda dungeon we played. It wasn't just an introduction to 3D Zelda, but the Zelda franchise itself. Needless to say, this level is pretty important. As being the first level in the game, it needed to familiarize players with a lot of the core elements of the game, such as combat and puzzle solving in a relatively safe environment, all while challenging new players without boring the seasoned ones. With all that considered, it's actually a fairly difficult balance that needed to be met. The best place to start when deciding whether or not this level succeeded in doing that is to simply start where every player does. The spacious first room is designed for the player to just stop and observe. While still being completely linear, the first room instantly tells the player that they are going to need to do a lot of wandering until they are familiar and understand their surroundings. This is one of the most crucial elements of presenting a challenging dungeon. Just upon entering, the daunting size and number of possible routes to go should be immediately presented to the player, and as a result, the task of navigating through it and learning the dungeon's layout will feel completely overwhelming. Each dungeon, with a few exceptions, employs this strategy, and it is effective every time. In the best cases, such as the Forest and Water Temple, this room will also serve as the central hub that the whole dungeon is built around. In the Deku Tree's case, the daunting size of the room is really more of an illusion than anything else. There's only one route to follow, and there's only one barrier obstructing the player from proceeding further upwards. It's pretty impressive how well this dungeon introduces a critical design technique while still being simple and effective in its own right. At the end of his first climb, Link is going to encounter his first door. While I do have a slight issue with the fact that there are doors inside a tree, it's a very minor issue and I'm willing to overlook it. Anyways, this is the first time Link will find himself in a separate room. Once inside, he gets the map, and in a later chest, he receives the compass. Or vice versa, I can't really remember which. While I do understand that having a mini-map to look at is an absolute must, and I do appreciate the thought behind it, I have to be honest, I have never used the maps as a way to navigate the dungeons. This could be chalked up to my just being too familiar with the layout of each dungeon to ever need a map, as I've played this game about a thousand times, but it's not just this game. I can't remember ever relying on the map in any of the dungeons in Majora's Mask, or even in A Link to the Past. I recently played that game for the first time on my old Game Boy and I know I didn't use the map. It's probably more of an issue with me than it is with the game really. It's just looking at the environment and actually exploring is more interesting than looking at some boring blue smudge. Once Link makes it to the second room, the player will acquire the Slingshot. It's a good first weapon as it corresponds directly to the targeting system in 3D space. This is also the first puzzle the player will have to face. The ladder to the way out hangs stuck behind some webs, and the player must logically deduce that they have to destroy them with the newly acquired weapon. It's incredibly basic, but does a good job of getting the player to recognize that some stage barriers are destructible and that they must creatively think of solutions to get rid of them. The puzzle serves as the basic foundation that the rest of the puzzles in this dungeon are based upon, and they only get more interesting from this point onward. 
I do have one complaint though, and that this is the only time I can remember that the slingshot actually breaks the spider webs. It seems like an oversight to have them be able to destroy the webs upon your first time using it, just to never have it work again later. Yes, I warned you, these reviews are really going to pick this game apart. The very next problem presented to the player are the spiders. For some reason, they like to periodically present their soft bellies to Link, and it's only logical that the player would learn to strike the enemy when it does so. This interaction with the spiders is the foundation for combat in this entire game. Later in the game, this concept will evolve as enemies require specific items to hurt them, specific actions to trigger opening their weak spot, and enemies generally just becoming tougher and more mobile. In this first case, the spider can't move from its spot and can be injured with pretty much anything. Once again, the game does an excellent job balancing the difficulty of the encounter while still teaching the player the basics of combat. The next puzzle is pretty genius. Link has to take a leap of faith from the top ledge, land on the web covering the hole below, and break through it with the momentum he's gained while falling. Navi drops a hint on how to solve it, but other than that, there's no explicit help given. A major visual clue are the outcrops that hang above the hole, which is in the center. Essentially, the player's focus is directed towards the hole in the middle, and only looks that way from the top level. Regardless, even if the player was still unable to guess, they probably get it by accident considering how it's just human nature to want to jump at least once. The lower floor amps up the difficulty of the puzzles a substantial degree. In the main room, Link needs to reach an area that leads to the boss room. Unfortunately, this area is beyond reach, and in order to get there, the player will have to proceed through a series of rooms. However, the door there is blocked with webs, and the player has to figure out a new way to get rid of them. This time, the task is a little more demanding. Not only must the player be intuitive enough to think of lighting the Deku stick with fire from the torch, but they must also guess that the webs are flammable. It's a natural progression of the earlier puzzles, and solving it is bound to feel rewarding. I can't say the entire game progresses in difficulty this smoothly, but it is at least perfect here. The last significant test forces Link to try swimming in order to push a switch underwater, and ride a platform across the water to the other side before the time limit runs out. This is the first puzzle that is guaranteed to cost the player some health by trial and error. It also introduces one of the most underdeveloped mechanics in the game. Swimming is needlessly restricted to simply going down for a few seconds. I don't understand this decision at all and the game would definitely be better without it. If the developers changed Link's swimming capabilities from what they are now to something more like in Super Mario 64, there could have been a real possibility for great water puzzle locations. In that game, Mario can swim in all directions, can perform a variety of moves while underwater, and his duration while submerged is determined by his health meter. But perhaps the biggest difference that separates Link and Mario is that Mario remains fixed in his position once the player stops playing. Link, on the other hand, will automatically swim to the surface if he isn't actively moving. If Link had been given a swimming mechanic similar to Mario's, the game could have integrated puzzles that exist seamlessly in both air and water, as well as entirely in water. Simply exploring secrets hidden underwater would have been good enough. Nonetheless, the water puzzle in this dungeon is about as good as it gets in the entire game. Yes, it's pretty disappointing. Not to waste too much time talking about a relatively unrelated detail, but it seems pretty clear that the developers learned from their mistake in this game and fixed it in the next. Zora Link is a massive improvement and is a definitive example of growth in the Zelda franchise. Anyways, shooting the eye to open a door is pretty basic and it really isn't all that interesting on its own. However, later in the game this concept evolves in every dungeon, so seeing it here for the first time is very welcoming. After murdering some newborns and crawling through a hole, the player will end up in an area where they needed to be all along. Just make sure not to mindlessly walk off, otherwise you'll have to go through all those rooms again. Something I've certainly never done before. There's a block that needs to be pushed so that Link can access the torch on the lower level so that he can burn the webs covering the floor on the higher level. This time, the player has to recall the previous web burning puzzle in order to solve this new one. The difference here is that the player needs to be really moving and do a barrel roll directly over the webs. It's really nothing more advanced than the previous time it was done, but the use of the roll to solve the problem feels quite natural. It's nice to see the possibilities of Link's basic abilities being stretched so early in the game. After defeating the Deku guards in order, Link enters the boss room. As a boss, Goma really isn't much. All she actually does is slowly walk forwards, before rearing and exposing her weak spot. The boss fight is incredibly simple, and uses the game's already established fighting mechanic quite well. 
even though this fight is almost laughably easy, I can't say I don't feel totally awesome just bodying the first boss of the game. And that's another problem I have with this game. It may be that I'm just too experienced now, but to me, the bosses come across as just being an extra ride at the end of a dungeon, rather than being an exciting challenge built up in anticipation while playing up to it. I guess you could boil down what I'm saying to simply, I want the bosses to be stronger, but that's really not it. I definitely think Zelda needs to evolve boss fights. Something like environmental puzzles and dangers while battling the monsters would definitely improve the boss battles, but more on that another time. And now that I'm done with gameplay, I will be discussing what really makes the Deku Tree great. Upon entering, it's immediately noticeable just how non-threatening this dungeon is. And it makes sense that it would be this way, not just from a gameplay perspective, this being the first dungeon and all, but also that this is inside the Great Deku Tree, a guardian spirit that watches over the Kokiri children and protects them. The entire first part of the game with Link waking up in his bed, exploring the lost woods to find a sword and shield, and then going off into the tree all feels very warm and safe. The colors are soft and inviting, the music is calm and ambient, especially in the Great Deku Tree, so that the whole vibe is soothing and relaxing more than anything else. With the previous Zelda games, the dungeons were really more than a series of nearly thematically identical dark grey castles that, while being distinct in their difficulty, felt the same due to nearly everything else about them being alike. As an experience, they certainly don't hold up when compared to the dungeons of Ocarina of Time, and the Great Deku Tree is a fantastic example of why. All of the aesthetic elements of the Great Deku Tree are unique to it, and work wonderfully to cement playing through the first level of Ocarina of Time as a memorable experience. When I think back to what playing this level was like, I get a feeling of isolation, but not loneliness. Rather, a feeling I really only get when I'm wandering alone in the forest by my home. This is all meant as build up to the real world, of course. Things don't stay warm and cozy forever. Link will have to grow up someday, and the warm and inviting beginning of his story will only serve to contrast the cold and indifferent world he comes to know. 